Hello everybody, and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. There are a number of theories in existence regarding how the Great Pyramid of Egypt was built, but how the Egyptians got the largest stones, those being 60 tonne blocks of solid as one granite, high into the structure is a mystery all on its own. Some hypotheses include internal lifts or elevators that operated through hydraulics. Others say that blocks were dragged up a long ramp that extended across the Giza Plateau all the way to the top of the pyramid, whilst others say that a ramp spiralled around the structure. Thanks to the work of Jean-Pierre Houdin and his density survey of the pyramid, we do know that there is a spiral ramp preserved inside the Great Pyramid, hidden behind the outer layer of masonry. But getting the granite blocks to the pyramid and then up would still be an unenviable task and some say it's impossible via the simple spiral ramp. But Jean-Pierre Houdin thinks he's got the answer. We know that the ancient Egyptians did transport huge blocks of stone, even larger than the Great Pyramid granite blocks, via boats on the River Nile. There is also strong evidence that the area in front of the Sphinx and Valley Temples was once a harbour, and this would be the closest to the Great Pyramid building site the granite blocks could reach without having to move them across land. Therefore, it is safe to assume that this is where the granite blocks landed at Giza, after being transported by boat from Aswan. Now, a slight change of subject, but a relevant one, and it's regarding the shape of the Sphinx enclosure, which, in my opinion, is the single biggest problem with the hypothesis that the Great Sphinx is far older than anything else on the Giza Plateau. The south wall of the enclosure is clearly dictated by the Cafre Causeway, if not, why is it not square? Why would the builders of the Great Sphinx create a monument perfectly facing east with a perfect east-west northern enclosure wall, a perfect north-south-western wall, but then create a southern wall at a completely random angle? And it is this south wall of the enclosure that contains most of the evidence for ancient water erosion. Therefore, for the hypothesis of a truly ancient sphinx to work, this wall can never have been reworked in pyramid building times. Therefore surely the Caffrey Causeway, or an earlier incarnation of it, was in place before the Sphinx was carved. The Sphinx enclosure was dug out around the causeway because the weathering shows that the causeway does not cut through an older enclosure, but it actually forms a southern boundary of it. With the surface luminescence dating, disputing geological analysis by Colin Reader, K. Lau Gowry, and Jean Christiansen, the age of the Sphinx enclosure, as detailed by Robert Schock, is compelling, but it certainly isn't conclusive. The relationship between the Caffrey Causeway and the Sphinx implies one of two things. Either the pyramids are far older than what Egyptologists say, or that the Sphinx is far younger than what Robert Schock says. But one thing is certain, in my eyes, the Caffrey Causeway must have come first. Interestingly, Houdin's hypothesis for how the 60 tonne granite blocks got to the Great Pyramid means the Caffrey Causeway did have to be built before the Great Pyramid. An important observation about the Caffrey Causeway, one which people rarely discuss, is its width. Why is it so wide compared to the other causeways? According to Houdan, the reason is because this is no ordinary processional causeway. It was actually one of the main construction ramps of the Great Pyramid, the ramp that was turned into a processional causeway on completion of the Second Pyramid, whether by Caffrey or somebody else. Houdan notes that the 10 meter wide Caffrey Causeway is laid onto a perfectly uniform foundation, which is a massive 23 meters wide. Therefore, the foundations extend for a further 6.5 metres from the causeway on both the north and south sides. To show just how unusual this is, the foundations of the Khufu Causeway that leads to the Great Pyramid has a width of just 10 metres, and the Menkore Causeway is just 8 metres wide. Caffrey's Causeway is more than twice as big, and this has to be for a logical reason. The reason, as stated, is because the Caffrey Causeway was originally a construction ramp for the pyramids of the Giza Plateau. Further proof is seen by the fact that there are quarries along the north and south sides of this causeway, and experts have identified that stone from quarries on both sides were used for the Great Pyramid, implying that the causeway was already there before the pyramid. 
The Cafre Causeway has a shallow slope of just 8.5 degrees and is nearly 500 meters long. The slope angle is safe for dragon sledges, whether on rollers or whatever mechanism was used, meaning it was not too steep and the blocks were never at risk of rolling back downhill. I'll explain the mechanism of moving the stone shortly. But how does using this causeway help get the blocks high up into the Great Pyramid structure? Well, the western end of the Cafre Causeway, where today the Cafre Pyramid is located, is topographically a lot higher than the foundations of the Great Pyramid. And that is why the Pyramid of Cafre often looks taller than the Great Pyramid, even though it is smaller. Once you get the huge Aswan granite blocks to the western end of the Cafre Causeway, to get them to a position high up on the Great Pyramid, you would not need a steep ramp. A second shallow ramp from the end of the Cafre Causeway to the Great Pyramid construction site would suffice, and it would get the blocks to at least the base of the King's Chamber. When at Giza, Houdan walked along the Cafre Causeway, and at its far western end, he looked at the point where the second ramp of the Great Pyramid should have began. He noted a large slab floor made of limestone blocks, and they were pointing towards the Great Pyramid. He notes that the orientation of these blocks have nothing to do with the Cafre Pyramid, as such infrastructure would not have been needed. He says that it's clear that these are the foundations for the external adjoining ramp to the Great Pyramid. So, this all seems logical and feasible, but I know what many of you will probably be thinking, because I was thinking the same, can humans really drag 60 ton granite blocks on a sledge for 500 meters along the Cafre Causeway? As we know, the pyramid builders were clearly intelligent and methodical, and therefore we can safely assume that they were also efficient in their planning. Additional force for moving these granite blocks was essential, and Houdan believes he has the answer, in that there must have been a counterweight that moved in a slide channel, a technique enabling human strength to be combined with mechanical force. Furthermore, Houdan also believes he's found evidence. To function, the counterweight would have had to have been located beyond the Cafre Causeway, most likely in a trench that would have had to have lined up with the causeway beyond its western end. This would place the trench we are looking for beneath where the Pyramid of Cafre is located today. And interestingly, inside the horizontal corridor that leads to the burial chamber beneath the Cafre Pyramid, a corridor that is dug 10 meters deep into the bedrock, there is a section about 8 meters long that differs from the rest of the corridor, in that it has been constructed with a floor, walls and ceiling added, whilst the rest of the corridor is simply dug into the bedrock. Therefore this implies that the 8 meter section must have once been a cavity. The 8 meter section is exactly in line with the Cafre Causeway, meaning there was clearly a sizeable hole to the west, which is likely to be the deep trench that Houdan's theory relies on, a trench built before the foundations of the Cafre Pyramid were lain. And, according to Houdan, it was obviously the missing slide channel for his counterweight system of moving the granite blocks. So, thanks to Houdan, we can see a straightforward yet brilliant system of engineering to get huge heavy stone blocks from the harbour all the way to at least halfway up the Great Pyramid. By this system, with the ramps illustrated here, Houdan worked out that the enormous granite blocks could reach the pyramid at a position of the base of the King's Chamber. From here, setting the blocks in place was another challenge, but Houdan has also shown how the Grand Gallery is in fact the Great Pyramid's internal counterweight system, and this was used to lift the granite blocks up onto the roof and beyond. Of course, enormous granite blocks do not make up the bulk of the pyramid, in fact it is made of far smaller blocks made of limestone, with an average weight of just 2.5 tonnes, as well as masses of sand to fill cavities. When the foundations of the Great Pyramid were laid, the core masonry limestone would have first been positioned using the internal spiral ramp system that was discovered by Houdan. And once the height was achieved to connect the second ramp from the Cafre Causeway, both ramp systems would have been used to get stone to the construction site to finish the job as swiftly as possible. This really is a brilliant hypothesis for getting granite to the high levels of the Great Pyramid, and because it explains a number of Giza anomalies, I'm pretty much sold on the idea. It explains why the Cafre Causeway is so wide. It also explains the bizarre masonry inside the Cafre Pyramid Horizontal Corridor.
But if correct, it surely proves that the Great Pyramid actually predates the Great Sphinx. As stated at the start of this video, the odd shape of the Sphinx enclosure can only be explained if the Khafre Causeway was already there before the Sphinx was dug out, because if not, then why is the enclosure this shape? This causeway was a construction ramp, and I believe it extended all the way to the harbour, and therefore it must predate the valley and Sphinx temples that are today located at its eastern end. Archaeologists may even be able to prove this if they could use technology to see below the foundations of the Valley Temple. I guess we should see the foundations of the causeway ramp beneath. The Great Pyramid was built and completed, but if the causeway was also used to transport stone for the later Khafre Pyramid, then it may imply that the Sphinx was actually built after these two pyramids. Egyptologists and alternative researchers believe the Valley Temple and Sphinx Temple were constructed together and were made using stone excavated from the Sphinx enclosure. But these could not have been built whilst the Khafre Causeway ramp was operational. As always, the more I look into the detail of Giza, the more confusing the picture gets, but we have to use logic to understand it. Houdin's hypothesis explains the mystery of getting the enormous granite blocks to the higher echelons of the pyramid, but if you believe the Sphinx is 10,000 or so years old and predates everything else at Giza, then you need to explain logically why the southern enclosure wall of the Great Sphinx, the wall that looks so weathered, was constructed at such an oblique angle. The only way that I can explain it is that the causeway was already there, in the form of a ramp for the construction of the Great Pyramid and then the Khafre Pyramid. This therefore means that the Sphinx came later, but does that mean that the pyramids are in fact thousands of years older than the 4th dynasty, or does that mean that the Sphinx was actually built in dynastic history? Please comment your thoughts below. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.